Good morning, Excellencies, uh, Prime Minister, uh, this, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Marshall, distinguished guests. Um, we are delighted to have the opportunity to host this special event in our Polish house in Brussels. Uh, our conference is a joint effort by the representation of Poland, uh, Mission of Ukraine to the EU, the European Commission, as well as the United uh, States mission to the EU. Our aim is to focus the future of Ukraine and the Central and Eastern Europe as a crucial region in terms of energy supply, routes and sources. On behalf of all organizers, I would like to welcome all our distinguished speakers and guests who are attending this conference. We are delighted to have you here and honored with the presence of so many eminent speakers and guests, experts, decision makers, representatives of key energy companies and EU institutions. We are privileged to have with us Mr. Volodymyr Groisman, the Prime Minister of Ukraine. We have also with us Mr. Maros Sevcovic, Vice President of the European Commission, and Mr. Adam Bielan, Deputy Speaker of the Polish Senate. I thank you most sincerely for coming. Timing of the conference is no co coincidence. There are multiple political processes which might see their finalization in the coming weeks and months. Among them, fate of polarizing and harmful Nord Stream 2 project, future of urgently needed gas directive, gas transit contract for Ukraine post-2019, as well as outcome of antitrust case against Gazprom. I'm convinced that all of those issues will be raised and discussed by our speakers and panelists. I'm also confident that the opening statements in few seconds and a subsequent stakeholders panel will give an ample opportunity for fruitful talks. I believe that today's discussion will contribute significantly to better understanding the challenges which the European Union and our partners in the neighborhood are facing. Please allow me to use this opportunity and invite you to other events organized uh, by the permanent representation of Re the Republic of Poland, especially EU budget uh, talk series, which will start next week at this very place. In conclusion, let me thank all again speakers and participants for joining us today. Uh, I wish you very best with uh, the deliberations. Mr. Prime Minister, you are welcome. Good morning, dear friends, dear colleagues, dear partners, very much respected Mr. Marshall, uh, Mr. President, I'm glad to have the opportunity today to speak at this conference because I believe today we're going to discuss very important issues, not only because of today, but also because of today and tomorrow in future. I thank you all the organizers who allowed to have this discussion panel with our Polish partners and our European Union partners. Uh, to discuss very important issues, energy security, as a matter of fact, we can forecast, but I would like to tell you today about a wonderful European country, about my country, Ukraine, and to define the fact that over the last 15 years, how our relations with Russia went in the energy sector. We understand that these relations have always been on the edge. Russia supplied gas to Ukraine and in return would demand part of Ukraine's sovereignty. Russia used as a gas as a weapon against Ukraine, against our independence, and was uh, causing our weaknesses. As a matter of fact, today we are facing a similar ch choice. What will happen to a modern-day Europe if, God forbid, Europe is going to lose its energy independence, if it becomes even more dependent on Russia? Russia the Russia that manifest, manifests aggression, unprecedented ag aggression lately. And today I should note that Ukraine has a very powerful, serious gas, transit, gas transport system that is capable to provide qualitatively the European consumers with the necessary amounts of natural gas. At the same time, Russia 
is coming out with this new project, and I categorically refuse to, to agree that this is a commercial project. This is a new hybrid weapon that is directed against the European Union and the European countries, and we should stop it, simply stop it. Today, the gas transport of Ukraine is capable by volume, by reliability, by its reliability, to provide everyone by 100 percent. We have great storage facilities to accumulate gas reserves. And there's no single need today to build new capacities, but Russia is going a different way. Their aim is to build their own gas transport system. In parallel, they want to annihilate the gas transport system of Ukraine, and they would like to have a single lever to influence European, the European countries. Before I became, before I started working at the central level of government, I was the mayor of Vinnytsia. Uh, I was the mayor of 400,000 residents in the city. Let me tell you about my practice. In 2005, there was a beginning of gas crisis with the Russian Federation, and I can tell you, as somebody who was responsible for that big city. At some point in time, just overnight, the Russian Federation decided that they can lower the pressure in the gas transport system and could create an artificial shortage in energy supplies. I'd like to convey to what I felt at that time, my emotions. When it was minus 25 out on the streets, when all heat supply systems were filled up with water, when hundreds and thousands of Ukrainian citizens became hostages of the aggressive actions on behalf of Russia, that was 2005. And I'd like to note here that can you imagine when people and their children get out on the streets because they can't keep warm, and we are, we were just on the verge of the technogenic technogen catastrophe, and that was just recent. And then recall, if I may say so, how these instruments of energy pressure that was exerted on Ukraine, how they were used in order to leave the Russian uh, Black Sea Fleet in the Ukrainian Crimea, at the end of the day, every year, Ukrainian governments were renewing negotiations with Russia because Russia was using this energy blackmail against a great 450 45 million country. My question to you is, who of the European countries want to repeat our history? And I think today there are declarations made that Russia will provide guarantees that the Ukrainian transport, gas transport system is going to work according to the volumes that were declared. But today we appeal to our international partners, the European Union, the United States, France, let's manage this gas transport system of Ukraine together so that we can be clearly provide for the operations for decades to come. And that's our responsibility because that would enable us to avoid the dependence of on the aggressive enemy who today is not choosing any elements, who not very selecting their weapons, but they will simply in an armed manner, the independent Ukraine. And I'm not talking about the agreements that were used as gas weapons that were used to annex Crimea. That was the first, the gas weapon was the first step to annex Crimea. So today we are responsible before our current generation and future generations. And I'm convinced that today all European leaders, all leaders of all countries are personally responsible for the generations to come for the security and energy independence of the European Union. Undoubtedly, any decision, especially such a complicated decision, requires our leadership. And now I'd like to thank today the European Union. I'd like to thank our Polish partners for the decisive position to make sure that the European Union is dependent on the Russian Federation, to ensure the independence of the European Union. Today, they're saying that Russia will provide guarantees. Colleagues in this hall, who believes the guarantees of Russia? What guarantee should that be in order for us to be confident in the future of our children and in the independence of our countries? My question is, if 
In this season of the highest gas consumption, Russia would decide to limit the supplies to the European countries. How much time would be needed for the governments of these countries to resign? How much time would be needed under these extreme conditions in order to control, to keep the situation under control? If Russia decides to do that, then these threats are, are inevitable uh, in a matter of days. And I believe we have no rights to put our citizens of democratic countries before such threat. If we're talking about the Russian guarantees, let's think about history. Let us not forecast anything. Let's just think back in history of their obligations, their commitments. For example, the Budapest Memorandum that Russia signed for, to, to ensure the security guarantees for Ukraine. What Russia did? They basically replaced the defense with aggression, with, attack, with the attack. The latest decision of the Stockholm arbitrage, where we actually won uh, the right on the, uh, on the contract that was illegally approved. And what is Russia doing now? Russia is not implementing and fulfilling the decision of this arbitrage. That means there's not a single guarantee in this world that Russia can provide and commit to. Another thing is, as soon as they build or potentially, if we can imagine that they would build North, Stri North Stream 2, they would in immediately would start in killing any possibilities for the Ukrainian gas system to uh, go through Ukraine and that, so that it could become a monopoly supply. And we can't afford it. We can't let them do that. So that's important today for the position of leaders of the countries. The position of the European Union is very important. Members of the European Union is very important in order for us to ensure that we, we should not commit the mistakes that were made by Ukraine at some point in time because of the leadership uh, was not astute enough, and that resulted in the uh, military aggression in Ukraine. I'd like to specifically thank uh, the United States of America and President Donald Trump for a clear leadership and a clear understanding of the problem and uh, for the defense of the interests of the democratic world. I'm deeply convinced that when we are together, when we understand the real threats, we will always f be able to find the adequate steps in order to prevent the aggression uh, from Russia on part of Russia that could become that Russia m might be a, an open democratic country but became instead a country an enemy country an aggressor country and we're when we're sitting in this room now right now as we speak in the Donbas area in the east of Ukraine Russia is killing the Ukrainian warriors Ukrainian army we are holding our defense. We are standing fast, but we just want to make sure that nobody would approach us from the rear, because the energy threat has a huge significance. Let us be strong. Let us be responsible before today and future generations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. And now I would like to ask Mr. Adam Bielan, Deputy Speaker of the Polish Senate, to take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prime Minister Groysman, uh, Mr. Vice President Sefcovic, Mr. Ambassador Sadosh, Ministers, Members of the European Parliament, Presidents of the Boards, ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests. I am very proud and honored to be opening which will focus on Central and Eastern Europe and Ukraine as a gas gateways to Europe. I am very happy that this timely gathering is organized jointly by the Polish Permanent Representation, Ukraine's mission to the European Union, the European Commission and the United States mission to the EU. I believe that this is very symbolic of our close cooperation and partnership. Today we host key decision makers, business leaders and experts to discuss solutions that will allow us to maintain the strategic importance of the eastern part of our continent for trade of energy sources. Regardless of how different certain proposals may be, I think this conference will show how committed we are as a region and as the EU as a whole to achieve this goal. Ladies and gentlemen, 
as you are all well aware, historically, Ukraine and the CE region have been dependent on Russian gas. But at the same time, countries like Ukraine, Poland, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic have been guaranteeing undisrupted flows through their pipeline systems laid on their territories. This partial interdependence could have been considered a source of stability for Europe in terms of gas transit and supplies. However, for several years now, Russia has been trying to completely redesign the supply patterns in Central and Eastern Europe. The Kremlin has been doing this at the expense of the key transit countries, Ukraine in particular. Nord Stream, South Stream, Turkish Stream have all been proposed to limit the CE's role as a gas entrance to Europe. In this context, the Nord Stream 2 project has also been proposed out of purely political goals to eliminate Russian dependence on Ukraine's gas route and thus increase the political leverage over Kiev and other CE's capitals. It is obvious that this strategy is meant to provide Moscow with additional tools to, to carry out its aggressive and neo-imperial policies against Ukraine. Honorable guests, we stand here today to confirm our solidarity with Ukraine and our commitment to maintain the country's key role in providing gas transit. For Europe's sake, the CEE gas gateway needs to remain open and protected. During their upcoming panels, expert decision makers and representatives of various companies will discuss detailed proposals for keeping the Ukraine route vibrant. However, please allow me to take the opportunity to outline a couple of conditions which we find necessary for making this happen. First of all, we believe in EU energy market principles. In the European Union, we are all, in, all interdependent and integrated. That means the economic interests of one country should not come at the expense of other member states of whole or whole regions. Nord Stream 2 clearly goes against this rule. Gas deals between a group of companies seem to be more important for certain governments than stability and prosperity of member states and the EU's closest strategic partners. Secondly, ladies and gentlemen, we need the European Commission and all EU institutions acting for the benefit of the EU and its member states, not for the benefit of an external company that for years has been abusing our market principles. The Gazprom antitrust case is the most recent example when European authorities could have done a better job protecting EU consumers and companies. Thirdly, we need key reforms of the Ukrainian gas market to further align it with the European Union's. Ukraine should fulfill its obligations stemming from the Energy Community Treaty. On this front, the Polish transmission system operator Gas System, among others, offers its advice and help with the unbundling process aimed at establishing an independent gas operator in Ukraine. We look forward to having this process completed in the coming months. Finally, we need the EU institutions to negotiate and guarantee future gas transit deals with the Russian Federation. Ukraine cannot be left alone during the negotiations with Gazprom. Similarly, gas deals cannot be negotiated behind our door back by a handful of governments. This process needs to be transparent and led by the EU. In addition, the EU as a whole should guarantee that outcomes are respected in the future. Most, important, most importantly, we need to examine the threats coming from alternatives that may endanger potential agreements between Ukraine and Gazprom. This brings me again to the crucial issue of Nord Stream 2. I wish to underscore that if we want to secure the CEE region as a gas gateway, we should together as the EU reject this investment. And we must always demand applying the EU law to Gazprom's activities so as to limit its disruptive impact on EU gas markets. Honorable guests, thank you for your attention. I, I would like to wish you all fruitful and constructive discussions on the future of our region. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Maros Szewczowicz, Vice President of the European Commission. 
Thank you very much, dear Prime Minister Dragoj Volodymyr, Marshal of the Senate, Ambassador, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. First, I really would like to thank you for your kind invitation to, import, uh, to discuss such an important uh, topic of prospects, challenges and conditions for maintaining the Ukrainian's role in Europe's uh, energy security after 2019. Ukraine, as uh, you know, is the most important uh, transportation route for Russian gas uh, to Europe. And in 2017, 93 billion of cubic meters of gas was uh, transited by Ukraine, which is the highest amount in the last uh, seven years. And we know that uh, the transit was uh, done in a very professional manner, very often under very difficult uh, circumstances. And I have to say that uh, despite all odds, the transportation route by Ukraine has worked reliably over the past years, despite different challenges. And this is notably thanks to the professionalism and devotion of uh, our Ukrainian partners, people working at all levels in, par in uh, public administration as well, in the gas companies, first and foremost, Naftogaz. And uh, as you know very well, it is the Commission's long-standing uh, position that Ukraine should remain an important gas transit uh, country after the expiry of the gas transit contract between Naftogaz and Gazprom on the 1st January of 2020. Continued long-term transit of Russian gas by Ukraine is uh, 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 of strategic importance and uh, it has uh, uh, huge implications for the energy security of the European Union and uh, uh, Ukraine. And we can bring in different factors starting from economy down to the security of supply reasons. And uh, I'm very glad to say that on this we have an absolute consensus in the European Union where all member states are supporting uh, uh, this uh, approach and are highlighting the strategic importance of continuation of the Ukrainian uh, uh, transit route in post-2019 uh, period. And I think that this uh, is very important also against the background uh, that Russian gas is and will remain an important energy source for the European Union. In order to achieve the goal maintaining the Ukrainian uh, transit route in the current uh, legally and politically challenging context, the best way forward uh, is to conduct trilateral talks between Russia, Ukraine and uh, the European Union as early as possible so we can uh, reach a timely agreement on the post-2019 transit. That is why at the beginning of uh, this week I have sent a letter to both the Ukrainian and Russian government inviting them uh, to start trilateral talks in the coming week, and I had the honor and the pleasure to hand over the original of that letter to the, uh, to the uh, uh, Prime Minister Grossman this morning. And I'm also uh, very glad to uh, uh, report uh, that uh, both European uh, members of the Normandy Forum, Germany and France, are very much interested in this process, and uh, we will be relying on their support. So. We can have a strong uh, uh, political push from all sides to arrive at a good solution and good decision if it comes uh, to post-2019 uh, um, decision on the continuation of Ukrainian gas transit. What we should focus our talks on? What should be the topics we would like to discuss in trilateral talks? I believe that such agreement should draw main parameters of the future transit including a long-term duration of gas transit, obligatory minimum yearly transit volumes, tariff level and possible guarantees. And one of uh, these key elements that are fixed, re relevant Russian and Ukrainian companies based upon this framework should work out uh, the commercial details which should lead to the new commercial contracts. And only once the viable long-term uh, gas transit by Ukraine is secured, the security of supply situation in Central and Eastern Europe can be considered and uh, assured. What I sensed from our discussion with the Prime Minister this morning, and I'm sure uh, what you felt also from his introductory remarks here, that we can have, uh, I hope, constructive and good uh, trilateral talks. Hopefully we will arrive at a uh, good agreement. But what we need is to build the confidence 
that the guarantees which we'll be discussing would be ironclad and would be respected. Therefore, what is very important for the uh, European Commission is uh, uh, that we have to respect the law, be it European law if it comes uh, to the pipelines being built um, on our territory, but also to respect the arbitration law. And you know that we welcome that Stockholm process was concluded and it brought legal clarity to the claims made by Naftogaz and Gazprom. And therefore the Commission expects both sides to respect the awards and that they become a basis for renewal of a good commercial relations between Naftogaz and Gazprom. And we believe that it is in the interest of all Gazprom and Naftogaz as well as Russia and uh, the European Union that Stockholm arbitration is followed. The clause on respect of Stockholm arbitration is in many uh, gas contracts and therefore we consider it as a very important uh, legal uh, guarantee that once uh, we have uh, a mutually signed to the concrete court arbitration, we should also respect it truly. Another topic which we discussed and where I thank and congratulate uh, the Prime Minister is that uh, they are developing and focusing not only the view on what the situation right now, but that together we are working on long-term future of Ukrainian energy system, on long-term future of how the gas would be supplied and distributed and therefore uh, the fact how much did they accomplished in gas market reforms over a short period of time, uh, it's remarkable because I know how sensitive it is when you have to raise the price uh, uh, for your consumers, where you have to uh, rise the cost of heating, where you have to rise the cost of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, energy production and uh, the fact that Ukraine has embarked on an unprecedented process of the liberalization and a lot uh, has been already uh, achieved in a relatively short period of time with huge political cost is something we have to recognize and uh, we have to uh, support. Because uh, we know that from the market uh, being fully reliant on direct supplies uh, uh, from Russia, uh, the Ukraine uh, has evolved into the a gas market which hosts today dozens of gas uh, traders operating in Ukraine and importing uh, from several European uh, member states. In addition, the Ukrainian gas consumption has uh, decreased dramatically while the gas uh, production has increased to the high levels in two decades uh, and uh, I was informed by the, by the Prime Minister that prospects are even brighter and more gas will be uh, extracted in Ukraine. However, um, uh, very often the tool which we are using more and more uh, in um, Europe uh, uh, is not yet fully used in Ukraine. And here I'm talking about energy efficiency and therefore I'm extremely pleased that together we fund the Special Energy Efficiency Fund where European Union, European Commission, also Ukrainian government uh, would uh, channel the necessary funds so we can start this uh, what I hope would be very wide, large and important process of increasing energy efficiency in Ukraine because it's the best tool how to tackle energy poverty. It's the best tool how to cut the bills for the vulnerable consumers and it's the best uh, way how to limit the need for imports. From European statistics we know that any percentage gain in energy efficiency would allow us to import of 2.7% less of the gas and I'm sure that in Ukraine the figures would be the same or the benefits would be even higher. So therefore the fact that we started, we operate and we have money for this very important task is a crucial. If speaking about uh, fundamental reforms, uh, where we see the next very important uh, my, uh, milestones, this would be the reforms covering the unbundling and reform of the public service uh, uh, obligations which are currently under the discussion. Because we know that without them being completed or uh, put on irreversible track, it will be very difficult uh, to speak of the completion of this successful uh, process of the gas market reforms. And we also know that uh, the window of opportunity is now because Ukraine 
needs to think long term, as I said, about its gas market uh, as a part of the EU energy union and uh, step up the efforts to create transparent and competitive uh, gas market. And it is crucial also in this context of talks about the future uh, of the gas transit. As regards unbundling, I strongly encourage Ukraine to make decisive steps in the coming weeks. And I know the Prime Minister is convening a special session on this on the 29th of May. And uh, we hope that uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, process uh, can take a form of uh, comprehensive unbundling package, including a roadmap for empowering the transmission system operator to operate in line with the European uh, Union rules, present necessary legal uh, changes and publish the contest uh, for foreign partners. And we know very well that there are a number of high reputable European companies who are ready to come uh, participate in, in, in such a process and cooperate very, very closely with the Ukrainian partners. And uh, we hope that the package, as I described it, could be still presented to the Rada by July uh, this year. I recognize that uh, Stockholm arbitration outcome uh, on the gas transit and supply between Aftogaz and Gazprom should be taken into account in the next steps of unbundling. We know that uh, uh, if we have a ruling and we have a clear law on this issue, we should respect it. But we also uh, believe that it should not be the reason to stop or postpone the ongoing unbundling processes. And as discussed with the Commission Services, uh, final stage of unbundling should be launched now and implementing, for example, by the means of stage approach over the next one and a half years. And Prime Minister was quite clear in our discussion that in this complex matter, we have to have our strategic vision, but at the same time, we have to listen to the legal advice because the situation is rather complex. The empowerment of the new transmission system operators is a, a very uh, a complex task which requires very, very solid preparation. And uh, this is why I strongly encourage uh, you that the, uh, that the coming months uh, would be used to ensure that the new transmission system operator can operate independently and professionally once all operation is uh, handed over to it. In order to make this transition smooth, uh, uh, I uh, encourage you to closely involve one or several foreign partners about whom I just spoke a minute ago to help finish transformation of the Ukrainian gas market and in particular to help modernize operation of the gas transmission system. To this end, uh, following a successful call for interest uh, uh, published earlier this year, which collected a number of interested transmission system operators, a binding context should be published as soon as possible. Potential partners should be requested to also provide a long-term vision uh, for the Ukrainian gas system and strong willingness to go into the close partnership. And it goes without saying that a pragmatic and goal-oriented working relationship of all relevant stakeholders in Ukraine under the leadership of the authorities and in good cooperation with Naftogaz is essential to make this complex process a success. Another key gas reform which needs particular attention now is the reform of the public service obligation. The Commission closely follows this reform, facilitating a solution which will allow protection of vulnerable consumers uh, uh, in Ukraine without undermining gas reforms and uh, transparency. And as the current system comes to an end on the 1st of June and following recent uh, discussions, we expect Ukraine to propose a transparent and efficient uh, system which can be implemented over the next two, three years. And finally, let me stress uh, that for the gas market reform to be completed, it is uh, essential that the energy regulator is fully operational, effective and truly independent from political influence and from particular interests. Just like in the European Union, member state, it plays a key role as a watchdog of the newly established market. The regulator, because of its role, is uh, 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 important in passing secondary legislation and tariff setting. And uh, we know that all regulators are particularly exposed to individual interest. Therefore, it needs to be equipped to withstand any individual attempts of the influence. The full independence of the energy regulator, uh, uh, a major uh, effort to achieve that is still required. Uh, and uh, we hope uh, that the new board uh, will demonstrate the resolve and help implement uh, reforms, ensuring a level playing field. Any potential conflict of interest of its members should be prevented. To close, let me 
finish by saying that the European Union security of supply strategy is uh, intrinsically linked to transit through Ukraine. Our diversification strategy under the Energy Union would not stand either in policy terms nor in practice if we give up on this strategically important route of gas supply. Our objective is that the Ukrainian gas system and its infrastructure is becoming an integral part of the European European Union's gas system. And it is inconceivable to make this happen by letting down the Ukrainian gas transmission system. I would like to thank the Ukrainian and uh, Polish partner for initiating and organizing this event. And I'm sure that the stakeholders discussion panel with high level participants will bring a fruitful and interesting discussion in advancing progress on Ukrainian gas transmission system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice President. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so far we have heard the Ukrainian, Polish and European perspective. And now we have the opportunity to listen to the American perspective. So I would like to ask Mr. Adam Schupp, who is Chargé d'Affaires of uh, the American Mission to the EU, to take the floor. Thank you very much. Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Marshal of the Senate, Mr. Vice President of the European Commission, distinguished guests, and dear friends, uh, thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you today. I bring you warm greetings from my new Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Mike Pompeo, uh, and a message uh, from our Secretary. I'd like to thank the governments of Poland uh, and Ukraine, as well as the Commission, for organizing this very important event. Uh, and talking about Central European, uh, Central and Eastern European future energy supplies and routes. We have long uh, been an advocate, advocate, a strong advocate for European energy security for decades. We see energy security as a key component of national security. But let's be frank among friends. Europe's reliance on Russian gas is a vulnerability. While Russia can and should remain an important supplier of gas to Europe, it should not be allowed to leverage market dominance to achieve political goals. Poland and Ukraine know this well, but I worry that others may have forgotten it when it comes to Russia, that energy supply is never just a commercial deal. Recent actions taken by Gazprom and Russia against Ukraine over the past three months provide a further reminder of Russia's goal of hurting Ukraine. First, immediately after the February 28th announcement of the Stockholm Arbitration Tribunal Award, Gazprom refused to supply Ukraine with gas due to be delivered March 1. Secondly, this was gas NAFTA gas had prepaid and according to Gazprom invoices in accordance with the Stockholm Arbitration Court Award. At the same time, Gazprom lowered pressure in its transit pipelines, placing U Ukraine's gas transit infrastructure and supplies to Europe at risk. Finally, in response to Russia's failure, failure to honor its commercial deals, Ukrainian citizens took the brunt of reduced gas supplies to ensure that no one in the rest of Europe suffered. For Russia, it's clear to us that gas is not simply a commodity to be traded. It's a foreign policy tool and a weapon. Gazprom's disregard for the law makes it increasingly clear how serious a threat Nord Stream 2 is for Europe. The United States government welcomed German Chancellor Merkel's statements on April 10th, acknowledging the political nature of the project. However, the United States government categorically rejects any notion that Nord Stream 2 would be acceptable if Russia were to guarantee a minimal volume of gas transit via Ukraine. Russia has made many assurances related to Nord Stream 2 and continued gas transit through Ukraine. But let's remember the countless broken promises and false claims that Russia has made to advance its own geopolitical objectives. From the violation of the terms of its gas supply with Ukraine that I just mentioned, to the invasion of Ukraine, to the use of chemical weapons on European soil, Russia violates these international norms to advance its own interests. Any promises related to future Ukrainian gas transit should be seen through this light. The revenue and leverage Russia would derive from Nord Stream 2 would only further enable the malign behaviors we are all united in opposing. As leaders, you all know firsthand the challenges faced in providing adequate and reliable supplies of energy to your citizens. If completed, Nord Stream 2 would undermine the great strides 
in the European Union taken towards your collective energy security goals while presenting acute security risks for all of Europe. In particular, Nord Stream 2 would divide Europe and strengthen Russia's ability to use its energy resources for political coercion and influence. Two, allow Russia to use the pipeline's construction as an excuse to increase its already aggressive military presence in the Baltic Sea. Three, undermine European energy diversification goals and stall critical other infrastructure projects that the EU has deemed vital via your project of common interest lists. And finally, hurt Ukraine's economic and strategic ability by giving Russia the ability to end gas transit via Ukraine, eliminating a powerful disincentive for further Russian aggression and a key tool for driving needed reforms in Ukraine. The United States takes Russia's interference in our democratic processes and its aggression in Ukraine very seriously. The US Congress overwhelmingly supported the Countering American Adversaries Through Sanctions Act, or CATSA, and the President signed CATSA into law. We have also committed to continue to coordinate with our partners in the implementation of these sanctions. While we don't comment on future, potential future sanctions actions, We've been clear that firms working in the Russian energy export pipeline sector are engaging in a line of business that carries sanction risks. We continue to review potential sanctions action and encourage governments or companies to contact us directly if they have questions about this project, about this process. The United States government stands in support of Ukraine, Poland, and other EU member states who view dependence on Russian gas as a national security threat and we urge all EU member states to join the chorus of nations on both sides of the Atlantic to oppose Nord Stream 2 and to support the future of Ukraine gas transit. Thank you again for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This concludes the first part of our conference. Let me invite you all to a coffee break, which is happening in that part of the building. And we meet again in 15 minutes. Thank you very much.
No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we don't need the translation equipment for, uh, for that session, so uh, I've been asked by the organizers that it would be kind if you can hand it back. Mr. Kortika? Ah, oh, yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Georg Zachmann. I'm a senior fellow at the uh, Brussels based think tank Bruegel and member of the German advisory group in Ukraine. So, I'm one of the few Germans mm -hmm. here, so please uh, bear with me. Um, as such, I've worked quite a lot on uh, gas markets in both the EU and in Ukraine, and I'm very pleased um, to welcome you to what promises to be a, an extremely interesting session. Uh, we have six high-level speakers from politics and the gas industry from Western, Central and Eastern Europe, and those players are ex uh, essentially the key players that might enable uh, and shape the gas transit through Ukraine and through Central and Eastern Europe in the, uh, in the coming decades. Um, the, uh, the issue, as we have heard before, is very timely and important for both the EU and Ukraine. And um, I think what is key in, uh, in the uh, development, in the future development, is that we come up with a trustful and fair relations between all partners involved. Now, as I said, we have uh, these six speakers. There are three elements that are currently not present, but that we all probably will keep in mind in the discussion. Uh, that's uh, because they will, uh, to some degree, shape the, the potential outcomes. That's Gazprom, that's Nord Stream 2, and uh, that's, uh, that's Germany. So I think in the strategic approaches that we are uh, discussing today, uh, it needs to be kept in mind that, uh, uh, that they, their reaction to a, to a potential solution. What we are going to discuss today is how gas transit through Ukraine can be organized after the expiration of the uh, gas transit contract uh, in 2019 and the possible commissioning of, uh, of Nord Stream and, and Turk Stream. I think that will be a challenge for all of us because uh, the current market rules and the physics might not fully uh, match each other. So um, in order to uh, keep an interesting uh, panel debate, um, I would like to, to ask these speakers to uh, constrain their initial statements to, uh, to about seven minutes. And uh, then I hope we can come up with, uh, with an interesting discussion on a mutually beneficial and feasible solution. So I would like to, to follow the, uh, the program and first give the floor to Michael Kortika, who is Deputy Minister of Energy of Poland. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this. Uh introduction and uh, uh, please uh, let me start with saying that uh, last days were marked with uh, new announcements and uh, key decisions regarding the future of natural gas sector in the EU and this conference uh, regarding our closest neighbor and key partner providing energy security to the EU is a great opportunity to sum up uh, latest development regarding the role of Gazprom and Russia on European gas market and also draw conclusions uh, for the future of the EU. Uh, so, uh, we as Poland, uh, we understand yes, uh, the, the recent announcement regarding start of tri trilateral discussions about future of supply of EU with Russia natural gas is important and Ukraine certainly should maintain its current role in gas transit. But start of such process should not be linked with any decisions regarding Nord Stream 2. So this conference is that therefore not only about role of Ukraine's gas transit to the EU, but also about place of Ukraine in Europe in general and about future relations between EU and Ukraine with Nord Stream 2 in the picture. And it's not just the matter of transit of natural gas, but rather Ukraine as a whole is at stake. European Eastern policy is at stake and not mentioning security 
of supply of the EU. This is why Poland and a number of other member states oppose plans of construction of Nord Stream 2, as this project is much more than only harmful for the development of European gas market, but also has major political consequences for the future of the European Union. This project contradicts over two decades of European integration of not only Poland, but all Central Euro Eastern European member states. It rewrites the politics of natural gas supplies to Europe for years to come and solidifies Russia's position on the EU gas markets thanks to exemptions from rules that have been set up to ensure that blue fuel becomes finally a commodity rather than a tool of political and economic pressure and coercion. That is what we also heard from many of the speakers who were here previously, Prime Minister Reusman, but also Polish Marshal, Vice President Shevchowicz and Charge d'Affaires of US uh, Embassy to the Commission. We understand that pro project promoters want to directly with Russia redefine the role of Ukraine as a transit country without Ukraine at the table. And as of today, no such agreements were made and start of negotiations is not equivalent to its finish. Another aspect of those relations is using dominant position by Gazprom in CE countries, which is to be taken into account. Proposal of commitment decision announced yesterday do not change behavior of Gazprom in CE. Commission had unique opportunity to fundamentally change the landscape of European gas market. Whether it will succeed, we shall see. Among the discriminatory measures used by Gazprom, were not only re-export clauses, which coupled with the take-or-pay principles and lack of alternative supply routes, allowed the company to effectively halt the creation of competitive gas market in Central and Eastern Europe. There cannot be a deal regarding future of gas supply to Europe and security of supply above Ukraine and CEE region. After all, in the past quarter of a century, Ukraine has already given up some of its Trump cards in exchange for guarantees of its territorial integrity and political independence. The Budapest Memorandum, a document uh, many would probably prefer to forget, but which was very well reminded by Prime Minister Reusman, did not survive the annexation of Crimea back in 2014. So why any guarantees in 2018 regarding Nord Stream 2 would be any different? Therefore, we hope for a success of dialogue, but without steps back as a prerequisite for the negotiations. European Commission should use all available tools to provide stable conditions for development of natural gas market both in the EU and in its surroundings. We wish all the best to Ukraine and Poland will stand firmly with Ukraine in this extremely crucial period for the future of gas market, energy independence and Ukraine sovereignty. Um, many thanks, Mr. Kurtika. Um, I would like now to give the floor to Dominic Ristori, the Director General for Energy of the European Commission. Thank you very much. I would like essentially to examine with you all the progress made regarding energy security and reform in Ukraine, and then to look about uh, perspective. First of all, if you are comparing the present situation today of Ukraine 
with a situation we had at the very beginning of a crisis Russia-Ukraine four years ago, we can see all the progress made and uh, uh, how important are the reform, not finished, but nevertheless resulting on a much more better situation than it was only four years ago. And uh, I repeat, as you know all, this is a very short period. I remember very well when we had to manage first the crisis. We proposed some key measures, in particular to immediately organize the reverse flow, in particular from Slovakia to Ukraine, in addition to Poland, Ukraine, and Hungary, Ukraine. We propose also to Ukraine to uh, put in place the necessary reform regarding the, the gas market. And this has been done in the double context of uh, our strategic relation on energy, supported by the Commission, as well as in the context of energy community, which is our best success in the front of external relation. I mean, external countries accepting to transpose on a voluntary basis some EU acquis the main EU acquis concerning uh, the main aspect of energy policy and with measures becoming binding. This is extremely important. When you are examining now the present situation, first of all, the transit of gas has never been so high as it was the case last year, reaching a total of 93 billion cubic metrics. Accordingly, when you see some of us speaking about 12 or 20 BCM, this is not very serious. And this transit has been managed very well, and we'd like to thank the president of Naftogaz because he has organized very well his company in a difficult context, but uh, being a very reliable partner for Europe because all this gas is arriving in Europe, and in particular in Central Europe, but not only in Central Europe, also in Italy, in Germany, etc. This is a fundamental point. And uh, this is important for Ukraine, but this is also equally important for Europe. 93 BCM is a lot. As you know, we have a market around 40 uh, 400 uh, BCM in total. Accordingly, uh, we are completely supporting Ukraine for putting in place a real vision for energy sector, covering all aspects, including the modernization of the whole system, including the modernization of gas transmission system, and we will, we will be ready to help for that. This is extremely important. As well as all the other aspects regarding the regulator. And I was in Kiev one month ago for discussing all this point with uh, authorities, but also having contact with uh, Naftogaz. I can say it is important to well realize the role of a really independent regulator for uh, addressing the main uh, management of gas in Ukraine. An independent regulator has to guarantee non-discriminatory tariff, has to guarantee non-discriminatory access to the grid, has to pay attention to some key aspect of new programming for new investment. And thus to maintain clear links with all its colleagues in the European Union. And this is extremely important. And we are facilitating, and we will facilitate, advice coming from key European energy regulators. Regarding unbundling, this is an important part of a third energy package, 
we cannot imagine to manage that from one day to the day after. It's uh, important to ensure fair conditions, open conditions, transparency. It's important also to select the best people with all qualifications. This is extremely important. And again, we will be ready, we are ready to facilitate all these things by taking into account all specificities attached to the Ukrainian situation. And regarding the perspective, of course, the Vice President said, we would like to relaunch the trilateral. We will support Ukraine for the period post-2019 regarding the transit, but based on real things. Based on the level of transit you had also last year, based with all key parameters. This should integrate the political dimension, as you know. But uh, I see also an important role at commercial level, at operational level. We should also facilitate and support the discussion between Naftogaz and its counterpart. This is also extremely important. And uh, uh, this will be well taken into due consideration. And regarding Nord Stream 2, as you know all, the Commission has proposed two things, a negotiation mandate plus an amendment of a gas directive, because we should ensure the applicability of some key energy principles. We cannot imagine a so important project built without any legal reference. We had the opportunity to say clearly, this is not a project corresponding with our priorities in terms of energy security, because the key concept is that of diversification, and this project is the opposite. But accordingly, he has no vocation to become a PCA, a project of common interest. He has no vocation to have access to community funding. But if built, he should obey to some key legal parameters. I am pleased to see all the progress made and all the support we received in the European Parliament, coming from all the support from all key political groups. And let me say, discussions are progressing in the council. And I hope that we will be in situation in that regard to open soon interinstitutional discussion regarding this proposal, because this proposal is representing the best solution for managing this delicate issue. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Mr. Restori. Uh, I think you made a very clear case on the uh, on the progress that has been made in, in Ukraine in the last years, and uh, that there are still significant steps ahead to achieve the uh, um, um, the rules of the uh, of the European market. Uh, I think a question then for the uh, for the panel that uh, that I would like to ask you later is on the uh, the obligations that the EU might have with respect to uh, to Ukraine. So whether it's kind of only obligations of Ukraine towards the EU or also vice versa. Uh, I would now like to, uh, to give the floor to, uh, uh, to Marjay Wozniak, uh, who is vice president of PGNIG, uh, so the big gas company in Poland. Uh, good morning, or good, yeah, almost morning <laughs> still. Um, thank you for inviting uh, me here. It's a great honor to have the possibility to. Uh, to share with you with our opinion about the current status and the situation of the uh, Central European energy market. Uh, and I would like to uh, underline that since the accession to the EU, all Polish governments uh, has continuously liberalized the Polish energy, the gas market. 
Poland has the most strict provisions on unbundling in the EU and was first to introduce full ownership unbundling under already second liberalization package. In the past decade, Poland introduced stock, I mean, uh, power and gas exchange, lifted most of the gas and electricity tariffs for consumers and facilitated the cross-border trade. The liberalization process in the EU and Poland worked until everybody played the same rules. However, now we have serious doubts uh, whether the current EU model will survive the next five years. The primary and the most significant reason is that now, for the EU, the politics is much more important than the economy and competition. Nord Stream 2 is just one example, and not the first one. The first one was the Nord Stream 2 1 and its onshore expansion Opal pipeline. When the Nord Stream 1 construction started, most governments supporting the project and the EU understood that Nord Stream cannot be monopolized by Gazprom. That is why the EU, which uh, prevented Gazprom from using more than 50% capacity of this pipeline. Since 2016, it has changed because of political pressure of Russia and now due to economical reasons, uh, the Commission allowed Gazprom to use almost 100% of Opal capacity and thus Nord Stream 1. Afterwards, part of the Commission, not all, and some member states pushed hard to allow the construction of Nord Stream 2, which increases, not decreases, the dependence and vulner vulnerability of Russian, um, on Russian supplies. And now the DG competition Yesterday, let Gazprom to, of the hook and accepted a pro-Russian deal to finish the antitrust proceeding without a fine. By the way, what we've been um, allowed to see yesterday, that's only this document, I have it here. That was what was published yesterday. It's a commitment proposal signed by two high-level managers of Gazprom from 15 March. That is all we have since yesterday. The specific case outreach Central Europe. During last decade, Central European gas consumer lost at least 19 billion euro because of Commission failed to conduct the proceeding against Gazprom. And the decision to accept Gazprom proposal of commitments does very little sense. First, in 2015, the Commission went strong accusing Gazprom on breaching the most fundamental provisions of, the, of EU competition energy law. Then, it seems that in 2018, the Commission accepts almost entirely the proposal of Gazprom on how to settle this case. Gazprom proposal. The occupation of Ukraine, Crimea and Donbass did not change the EU approach. The monopoly of Opal pipeline didn't either. Finally, the, conti uh, the continuous breach of EU law, in spite of seven-year-long antitrust proceeding, did not impact the competition approach. One thing did. The construction of Nord Stream 2 is about to start. And in order to allow this the competition had a clear ground for uh, had to clear ground for uh, Gazprom as it increases the regulatory security of Nord Stream to investors. This is exactly exactly why we do we cannot longer believe that the internal gas market, as we projected it a couple of years ago, will survive next five years because politics overpowered the economy. The commitments which were probably um, adopted yesterday will not prevent Gazprom from dominating the Central European market. The Commission's inability either to find Gazprom or to introduce safeguards on the EU gas market will result in more dominance and combined with Nord Stream 2, a Gazprom monopoly in Central Europe. Gazprom prices will not be decreased for Central Europe companies. 
Commission has done, what Commission has done instead is a proposal to resolve the pricing issues through arbitrations against Gazprom. We could. But would Gazprom approve those verdicts? I think Mr. Kobolev, who's sitting next to me, is better suited to answer this question based on Naftuha's experience in terms of arbitrage with Gazprom from this March. While we observed a lack of ability of the Commission to protect gas consumers, I would like to underline this. That's how they feel. The Commission is not protecting gas consumers in European, Central European uh, Europe. We wanted to do it on our own way. Poland needs not more than five years to construct the infrastructure necessary to fully diversify uh, gas supplies from Russian dominant supplier, which is the current situation. We are increasing the LNG capacities in our terminal on the Baltic Sea. We are preparing one of the most important infrastructure projects for Poland, which is the Baltic Pipe pipeline, which will connect Poland with Norwegian fields through Denmark. As a final word, after yesterday's decision, I would like to say that institutional institutions which are able to effectively and professionally protect the consumers against monopolies exist. Russian Federal Antitrust Administration has fined Gazprom last week for breaching the Russian competition law with a very real fine, which was 200 million rubles, which means around 20 million euros. The charge was limitation of gas market access in order to eliminate other companies from this market. Ladies and gentlemen, there is only one thing to say right now. There is no other way to protect our rights but to take matters into our own hands. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Mr. Wozniak, for this uh, for this very striking case you made that the uh, that the European gas market model essentially still prefers the uh, the cheapest supplier over the most safe one, and uh, that it's um, sometimes difficult to to reconcile the two objectives with the existing market model. I think it's uh, something that uh, that needs to be discussed. Um, I would like to uh, to now give the uh, the floor to uh, to Andrei Kobolev, the uh, CEO of Naftogaz, uh, the Ukrainian uh, integrated uh, gas company. Um, I guess I will show a couple of slides uh, to support my point. But before slides are being put on the screen, I'd like to refer to the point um, the moderator made: is that uh, Europe is choosing uh, cheapest supplier. Uh, at the expense of more reliable one. Um, it's not the case uh, in all countries. In Central Eastern Europe, in many cases, Gazprom price is much higher than market price. And this decision of Stockholm Tribunal, the first one which will go to the end of 2017, also included specific reference to the fact that Gazprom was overcharging Ukraine. So in some cases, for Western Europe, Gazprom has one approach, Whereas for Central Eastern Europe, Gazprom has a different approach. And that approach is based not only on a uh, foreclosing market, uh, but that foreclosing uh, is used to maintain dominant position, and that dominant position is used to overcharge suppliers. So this is one correction I wanted to make. Um, I would like to um, comment on an uh, issue which was often raised today uh, by many speakers, uh, also during previous session issue uh, which we in Naftogaz and I believe generally in Ukraine are convinced is of strategic in, uh, importance for development uh, not only of gas market in Ukraine properly but also for um, fully integrating um, Ukraine into European gas market uh, without leaving possibility to, to reverse that integration. I must say that from point of view of Naftogaz, um, there, there are some people who doubt whether we are serious about this. I'd like to make two comments about uh, unbundling um, why we are serious about this. Firstly, it is exactly our team who proposed that unbundling should be made in 2014. One would wonder why. 
I am always citing um, one strategic thinker uh, to my personnel. That when you talk about strategy, many people like to discuss where you want to get, where you want to be, visions, goals, and uh, stuff like that. Definitely it's all important, but from my perspective, any strategic document should start with a bit different paragraph. It should start with a paragraph what you are prepared to sacrifice to get what you want to get, because otherwise it makes no sense. From Naftogaz perspective, we are prepared and we were prepared and we proposed that transit business and gas transmission business in general should be moved outside the group of Naftogaz for several reasons to remove from us monopoly tech in Ukraine, firstly. Secondly, to make sure transit uh, is kept in Ukraine because it's a matter of strategic interest. With time, four years have passed, I see another, the last one, but not least important reason to do unbundling. And that reason is quite simple. We've achieved certain significant market change. That change comes from Quite simple to understand, but difficult to achieve exercise. Removing corruption. Mr. Firtas, he's still in Vienna in his beautiful castle, but he is not managing our GTS anymore. That's one of the biggest achievements. And uh, because of that, we are, ma we are making progress in diversification, uh, in creating uh, supplies from Europe, in allowing free third party access to our network, and many other things. But if things change and he is back, all efforts of our team, these four years of our time invested, will be basically wasted. And the best way to achieve irreversibility is to make sure there is a European partner that would manage our DTS and that partner will make sure that corrupt people will never be back. So that's the point. Those three points are very important to understand and after gas real intent. So when we are being told by some people, why don't you just give away the system to someone, except for all other considerations such as trends and Gazprom, I'm also asking someone meaning to whom. Can you show us properly structured entity with proper corporate governance that will ensure compliance and transparency in the future, which means proper arms length basis approach to all market participants, not only enough to gas. As soon as that partner is there, and we are looking for that partner, and as soon as we comply with our transit contract with Gazprom, that can be achieved. That's just a start which describes point of view of NAFTA gas and our ideology. Uh, I would just start with a small brief uh, mentioning of a couple of parameters of Ukraine system. Can you please move to the next slide? Uh, you probably know about this. System is huge, uh, 38,000 kilometers. It is currently overcapacitated, though we had quite high transit uh, in previous year as it capacity. Sorry, 146 uh, billion cubic meters per year, um, and uh, the um, uh, relation between domestic consumption and transit is approximately one to three. So our system, 75% of its, uh, let's say, revenues and its activities are performed around transit of gas, uh, exclusively Russian gas, uh, to European countries. Next slide, please. What is also interesting about our system, uh, our system has the uh, highest coefficient of variation between usual daily transit volume and peak uh, volumes. It's close to 30%. If we compare it to North Stream, the coefficient there is less than 1%. Next slide, please. And if you look at the reliability of the system, if you look at disruption index, we are comparing currently ourselves to Gazprom, and the index is adjusted to the length of the system. So basically, it's uh, divided also by the difference in lengths. Uh, our system is significantly more reliable. Given all those technical parameters, uh, one would wonder uh, what is preventing us from unbundling. And as uh, we love to say, and there's English expressions, there's elephant in the room. In our case, it's not elephant. We have a bear in the room. 
And um, I was personally choosing this picture uh, because our team gave like an aggressive bear, but I believe they are wrong. It's not aggressive bear. It's a very relaxed, well-fed, pretty much uh, comfortable bear. He read recently the report from Antitrust Commission. He likes it. Nice report. Thank you so much. Uh, and he's waiting because basically there is nothing to shred the bear. So he just sits there and uh, is doing nothing. Uh, why uh, the bears are important for consideration of unbundling? Uh, and I mentioned this uh, relation between uh, domestic transportation and transit uh, for important purpose. Uh, if you would imagine a transmission system uh, where 25% of activities is compliant with certain energy package and 75% is not compliant because Gazprom doesn't want to comply. Can you consider unbundling effective? I think the obvious answer is no. The answer is supported by all people who understand what unbundling means and how it should be working. Next slide, please. Uh, we and NFT Gas um, started addressing the issue uh, in 2014. We have requested formally Gazprom to comply with EU energy law, in particular to give us permission to reassign existing contract to a newly created operator. Well, expectedly Gazprom refused because they usually say no to anything which undermines position of the bear. Uh, Naftagas suggested trilateral discussion in the format which was successful to ensure gas supply to Ukraine. Gazprom refused because they said it's not the matter for discussion with you. Uh, is bilateral negotiations, so they simply refused. Uh, as an outcome, we decided to go to Stockholm Tribunal, uh, and uh, Stockholm Tribunal in March 2018 ruled that it's not up to them to decide whether Gazprom should be required to resign the contract or not, but it's up to Ukrainian and European regulators to decide. And it's up to them because they're the ones who should have the leverage to make Gazprom comply with legislation, which, by the way, on one hand is quite pragmatic, on the other hand is a very relevant decision, because that's exactly the role of the regulators. Next slide. Uh, while waiting for Gazprom decision, uh, NAFTA gas team has achieved certain elements of progress. Uh, gas market law was uh, implemented, which is compliance with energy package. Uh, we have created an independent, well, not independent, but a separated branch, and all assets of existing GTS operator were moved to this branch, and that branch can be used in the future as a basis for creating a full separate TSO by simply taking branch outside the gas group and moving elsewhere. Uh, we also ensure third party access uh, for everybody in the market. And I believe that companies who are working in Ukraine currently, and we have a huge number of big companies importing selling gas, can confirm that TPA in Ukraine is actually not a joke. It's actually working. Where we are still not capable of complying with the uh, European acquis uh, is that we cannot move fully this branch outside NAFTA gas group because our contact with Gazprom requ requires us specifically to control the system. Otherwise, if we do it, the easiest move Gazprom can do is based on that move, simply cancel the contract. And Ukraine is a country, and NAFTA gas as a group is making approximately 3% of our GDP on transit currently. For us, it's a vital amount. Next slide, please. Uh, key considerations which should be taken into account as to how unbundling should be done after the end of the contract. Firstly, it's compliance with European law. Secondly, proper capacity booking either by Gazprom or other EU of takers or maybe Russian companies. And uh, thirdly, uh, we should take into consideration how our transit rate can uh, vary depending on the volumes and the time of the booking. Uh, our current rate of 2.40 cm per 100 kilometers uh, for 110 BCM can be even lowered where there is a company uh, like Gazprom, for example, who will do a big long-term booking with other proper conditions, such as our ability to pledge contracts and trust lower capital because of that. Uh, how we believe is a, what is the most evident and the best route 
to achieve on one hand unbundling, on the other hand, on the other hand compliance, and uh, also to ensure irreversibility is changed, as I mentioned before. Next slide, please. Uh, our position in Naftogaz, and that was our position 2014, which was later translated through support of people, deputies of Ukraine, into a new law, that we should attract strategic partner. And the law which was adopted then is quite revolutionary, because for the first time in Ukrainian history, uh, our parliament allowed to engage any company, which is not state-owned, but outside Ukraine, into uh, joint uh, either ownership or management of Ukrainian NGTS. Uh, what we are also considering Naftigas, and that's our advice to the state and to the government, is that if there is not willingness from international partners to take control over the whole system, separation of transit can be considered, and separation of underground gas storages, which is quite a expensive, but not much, let's say, profitable asset to uh, cover the cost of capital, can be moved out of the equation. If there is willingness to manage the asset, it can be done. If there is willingness to manage only transit, we enough to guys believe that option should be seriously considered. Next slide, please. To simplify decision making uh, in terms of unbundling, uh, giving our bands room, we have developed two simple decision trees. First one is for the period until 2019, and uh, it basically starts with a simple question. Uh, can regulator and uh, EU uh, bodies make Gazprom amend the transit contract to comply with the law? Uh, if the answer is yes, there is an option until 2019 actually transfer assets, complete and binding, uh, unlock full virtual uh, reverse flow, become fully compliant with certain energy package. If answer is no, and so far it has been no, you can't do anything of the above without significantly damaging interests of both Ukraine and European gas consumers. Because interruption of gas in case of cancellation of contract becomes a very, very possible scenario as was done already in 2009. However, after 2019, we have more options. Next slide, please. If you look what will happen when the contract will expire, we believe uh, that firstly, we should try to have a proper contract with Gazprom, where Gazprom will book capacity under Ukrainian law. Uh, foreign partner will be responsible for managing Ukrainian system, which will automatically mean that full ownership and bundling becomes possible and should be done. And in that case, uh, partnership model uh, between operator and Ukraine government in terms of either management contract or lease, or if there is a willing partner to purchase a system that can be also considered, should be implemented. The same model can be implemented uh, if, let's say, Gazprom says no, we don't buy, uh, we don't want to book capacities, but the point which can be uh, implemented there is that Gazprom can start giving gas on the western border of Russia, eastern border of Ukraine, and new of takers can book capacity. So far, I know at least two companies who've tested that idea with Gazprom, all of them received negative reply. Uh, Gazprom, the latest discussion we heard uh, was people who went to Moscow to talk about uh, this, uh, is that like, look guys, all old contracts stay, but if we have a new contract with someone, maybe then. Which again, I understand is a way of saying no. Uh, if all of those options are not available, then again, either after gas or any other state-owned company will have to start doing swaps. That's the last option we believe, and then only ITO model on bundling if it's enough to gas would be possible. Uh, next slide, please. Our view is that in terms of implementation of unbundling, it's important to allow to negotiate properly, starting with the most compliant and most comprehensive uh, decision on the last decision tree, the first one. In this respect, we very much welcome negotiations which have initiated the European Commission. 
we hope those negotiations will include Gazprom. And uh, I have uh, long experience talking to these guys somewhere from 2006. Uh, my position, uh, I've told our European colleagues, is quite simple. If Gazprom is not in the room, there is no point to talk to anyone because that's a trick. You can decide anything with the Ministry of Energy, then Mr. Miller comes, reminds everybody that they are private joint stock company with majority shareholding of the state, but still there are private investors, and that's why position of the Ministry of Energy is not crucial for him. I've seen this many times. So Gazprom should be in the room. And uh, if, uh, no matter how successful those negotiations are, uh, we believe that with the help of uh, European Commission, Ukrainian side should continue the process of finding partners for our system in order to make sure that by the end of 2019, specifically by January 2020, the contract with new partner will be signed. And when our contract is ex expires with Gazprom, system can be managed with assistance of proper international uh, and compliant uh, with European legislation energy company. Uh, thank you for your attention. Um, many thanks, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kobolev. Um, I think that was a, a very structured and very strategic approach, and uh, it's much to be discussed about that. And you uh, you mentioned at the beginning about uh, the the need um, for workable, proper unbundling of an EU partner in the uh, in the gas transit system, which leads me to the uh, to the two last speakers. Uh, which are both representing uh, European companies that uh, have discussed with some some interest a potential involvement in the uh, in the Ukrainian gas market. So uh, it's now my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Ratislav Nukovic, the CEO of EUStream, which is the Slovak gas transmission system operator. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, uh, Andrei said a lot of uh, interesting and very detailed things for introductory speech. It was really uh, very digestive. So. Uh, maybe later we can discuss it more in details, but I would like to come back to the title, uh, Future of uh, Gas System of Ukraine. Well, uh, Ustream operates a uh, gas system just adjacent to uh, Ukraine. Basically, we are a continuation of uh, EU transit, so it's in our uh, natural interest that uh, flows via Ukraine uh, will, will remain. Uh, uh, at this stage, I would like to confirm that uh, our cooperation with Ukrainian colleagues, either Naftogaz, Ukrainian are very good. These are professionals uh, which uh, know perfectly what they are doing, and their system, their fundamentals are reliable. And after modernization, I think they can reliably serve for many decades. Uh, we pass through uh, such ex uh, exercise during recent years, and we would like to offer our expertise for our colleagues. Uh, we, together with our uh, colleagues from SNAM, are part of uh, the tender, so we are one of the tenders announced by Ukrainian uh, government. So we take also active steps how to, how to uh, contribute uh, to future of Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian systems. Of course, this topic uh, is not only economical. Uh, there are many politics uh, evidence. It's clear from up to now uh, discussion. Uh, nevertheless, on corporate level, we would like to focus on pragmatic aspects which could be then placed on table during whatever discussion. Maybe it could be this multilateral, uh, which was uh, proposed by uh, Maroshevchovic. I witnessed your slide that there are some problems with, uh, with multilateral uh, discussions. Nevertheless, I think that EU has good leverage to uh, attract all partners for such a table. So what are these arguments? If we take into account uh, security of supply many times, uh, supply many times uh, mentioned, uh, Last year, there was 93 BCM transported via uh, Ukraine. If we take capacity of Nord Stream 2 plus Turkish Stream, this is roughly the similar uh, figure. So this volume could be replaced, but without any reserve. And this is pure security supply issue, but this is not valid only for Europe, but also for Gazprom. 
If you look at operation of Yamal or Nord Stream 1, every single year there are several weeks of maintenance. And you cannot say to customers, please don't use uh, gas because we are maintaining. So you need spare capacity. And uh, Ukrainian system is perfectly for, uh, suitable for, for that. So this is first aspect. Then there are economical uh, aspects, taking into account stable uh, out, uh, outlook of uh, European consumption and dropping trend of indigenous production, there is clear import gap uh, which is uh, rapidly rising, more than 30 BCM in 2025. I think Russian gas is first in ranking uh, to cover this import gap and Ukrainian system is first in, in ranking to transport this gas. So we have another pragmatic uh, argument uh, on table which can be which can be used uh, there are many external aspects being discussed uh, in uh, within topic of future of Ukraine system but I think there is a lot of homework also for Ukraine uh, witnessing a lot of discussions for example regarding uh, this uh, tender uh, for partner uh, there are different approaches, different, let's say, ideas, and I think uh, many things realize really on Ukraine, and they have a lot of, lot of homework uh, to do in order to be uh, successful. So it, many things are up to, up to Ukraine. Uh, and let me conclude with one maybe more general uh, remark. Gas industry, I think, faces two main challenges today. First is a uh, big pressure of renew renewables. Here, I think it's up to us, gas industry, to challenge and to, to manage it. It's manageable, clearly, uh, to introduce new uh, ideas, uh, new uh, solutions, which makes gas more green, less fossil. And there is another aspect which uh, uh, increased uh, uh, after 2009 and this is negative public awareness of gas as reliable fuel. Uh, I uh, am given many times a question from ordinary people, nothing from gas, nothing from energy industry, and they are asking me, will uh, be gas available to, during this winter? Uh, and it's, I think, big threat for us, for gas industry, for energy industry. And even after today's discussion, I think there will be some, uh, some titles in newspapers which contribute to this, let's say, negative perception of citizens who know nothing about politics, about things behind. So I think it's duty of all of us to try to solve the issue as soon as possible and maybe via proposed uh, multilateral, multilateral uh, meeting and come with a conclusion for European citizens. Yes, we have a solution. You can rely on gas as a fuel. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Thank you, Mr. Nukovic. Uh, I think you, you made a very clear case that there is a massive win-win to be made uh, with, uh, if all three essential partners come together here. Russia as a producer of relatively cheap gas, the transit countries uh, as, as providers of reliable transit, and the consumers with a high willingness to pay for reliable gas. So there is a big win in this, uh, in this game to be made, and it needs to be organized in a way that is uh, mutually beneficial for, for each of the sides, so that this benefit is fairly shared between the, between the three sides. Um, I would now like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Terry, who is the senior vice president of uh, GLT Gas, uh, the uh, French gas system uh, operator, but not only that, uh, also in, uh, in other parts of uh, Europe, very active. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, good um, so as you said, Geotigas is a transmission operator, but not only, we are also the only three out of the four LNG terminals in France. Specifically, specifically subject... Okay, thank you very much. 
Uh, I would like to stress out that Geotigas is also the shareholder of Megal. Uh, Megal is a German pipeline that brings gas to France along the traditional routes of Russian gas, moving gas from Russia, Ukraine, Slovakia, Germany, and this pipeline up to France. So it's expli exp explicit in this respect why Geotigas is also very much interested in the future of the Ukrainian gas transit. Um, so transit, uh, several projects are currently bypassing Ukraine, so we heard a lot this morning about Nord Stream 2, but uh, also there is Turkish Stream 1 and 2 and possible expansions, which is my view, or my, uh, should be a very much concern for, for Ukraine also. And as we, we speak this morning, the transit contract in Ukraine with Gazprom is expiring at the end of 2019. And uh, of course, a lot of work has to be done to pursue this contract. And we have seen this morning the position of the EU with Vice President Sefcovic. And uh, we understood that the time has come now for the round of trilateral talks between Russia, and Ukraine and the EU. I noted that uh, there is a need of a long-term transit of Russian gas through Ukraine to the EU in a reliable and commercially viable way. Based on this uh, declaration, what could we do as TSO? Uh, so first, what are in our view the key targets for the Ukrainian TSO to help a positive outcome of this trilateral negotiation? So clearly, in our view, the key objective for the Ukrainian TSO it was it will be able to demonstrate its independence, its reliability, its efficiency, and its transparency. It's clearly a necessary condition to for the continuation of the transit flow through Ukraine. And um, in this respect, we think that a, a European consortium could help as an intermediate role between the two parties. We also think we also like to stress that we spoke a lot about transit, but for the f in our view, one of the main aspects for Europe and for Ukraine is the development of a well-functioning and liquid domestic gas market that could come in time. <laughs> okay, um, and the, uh, a well-functioning and liquid domestic gas market, and in time could develop as an influential re regional hub. Why? Because there is a, Ukraine is already a producer of gas, but there is also discoveries and future production coming in the Black Sea by 2025. And of course, it will be very important for the European perspective in terms of EU supply, and also it will generate transit uh, for the Ukrainian TSO. Uh, transit that is maybe will be not given by Russian gas transit. This is why in our approach, in our consortium with Getni and Transgas of Romania, we think we need to consider the Ukrainian uh, network as a whole, not just transit, because there is a lot of synergies, and this first synergies is between also transit and domestic production in the long run. And last, how could we help as European partner? So we have been contacted, like our colleagues of Ustream, in 2016 to help on the transit and unbundling issue. Uh, and clearly, how do we position ourselves? We consider ourselves as a technical tool in the end of the Ukrainian authorities, Ukrainian stakeholder, and international stakeholder. We would follow the roadmap and guideline given by these authorities to, to us as technical uh, tool uh, and helpers in this situation. Based on our analysis, we recommend a, rec a management contract uh, to help uh, the Ukrainian uh, stakeholder on the transit and bundling issue because it is a well-known device used many, many times in the world by World Bank or by uh, BIRD in many countries to solve this type of situations. What does a management contract mean? It means substantial involvement in the management of the Ukrainian TSO. It means deploying world-class experts from our companies during this time. And more important in our view is to educate young Ukrainian high potential who will be trained in order to take key management position over time. I would like also to stress that we are very confident in the technical capabilities of the Ukrainian engineer that we met and uh, for the fuel modernization of the network. And we acknowledge that there's a lot of work that has already been performed by Naftogaz and, and Ertransgas on the unbundling part, as far as we have been informed. Uh, so this is what we wanted to say. Many thanks, Mr. Uh, Thierry. Um, 
It's very difficult to, to summarize uh, the debate uh, in, in a few words, but uh, I picked up uh, essentially four options that, uh, that have been discussed for the future of the uh, of gas transportation in Central Eastern Europe. One is, uh, which has been proposed and discussed in, uh, in this very morning, about uh, trilateral intergovernmental agreements and, uh, and potential outcomes of, uh, of such an uh, intergovernmental agreement. I personally would wonder how that goes together with the uh, with the rules of the uh, of a free market, but that that seems to be discussed. Another uh, proposal that has been discussed strongly, and I think Mr. Kobolev made the uh, made the case for that, is uh, strong reforms on uh, in in Ukraine to uh, to really become member of the of the energy community and. Um, uh, also benefit then from the uh, uh, from solidarity inside the EU. Uh, a third thing that they are not mutually uh, exclusive is not to build Nord Stream 2 uh, in order to reduce the, the physical uh, issues that might arise from that for um, uh, for gas transmission in Central Eastern Europe. And the uh, and the fourth uh, discussion point was uh, in terms of uh, of transit guarantees. Now we have ten minutes left and we have six speakers, which makes it quite a challenge to uh, to get to a uh, to a last round. Uh, but I would kindly uh, invite back the, uh, uh, the two remaining uh, panelists and uh, in the same order as before, maybe uh, give, uh, give a very short statement of, uh, of where you see uh, um, the, the options essentially going. Yes, first of all, I can confirm the availability of a commission to support the trilateral. We are asking Russia and Ukraine to come in back for discussion. I see in that context an important role also for the companies, for Gazprom and Aftogaz, and this was an important point well underlined by Mr. Kobolev, and I agree. Uh, second, it is important to have in mind the fact that since two years, Ukraine has not used any Russian gas. This is a major achievement. Four years ago, if uh, someone has explained that to anybody, uh, this would, would be unbelievable. It's a case, it's, it's a point. Ukraine has made important progress in the front of reducing energy consumption, around 40%, and it can go largely beyond. Ukraine can also increase its indigenous production of gas. Ukraine can also play a very important role regarding storage and I see many uh, European companies ready to uh, participate on that. And Ukraine has also important resources on renewables. And at the same time, regarding the aspect of regulatory framework, we will strongly support the reform. But the reform finishing, as it was very well presented by Mr. Kovalev, with important progress with qualified persons, with persons reliable. And uh, the fight against corruption, as you know, is a must. Is a must, and it is extremely important to help all those in situation to develop a new and transparent climate of affairs and business in this country. And I'm uh, confident that uh, joining forces, we will finish with excellent results and uh, uh, Ukraine is extremely important for our energy security. Donc, we will do also all the best in order to finish with uh, the adequate result in terms of the transit post-2019. And regarding Nord Stream 2, I can confirm we strongly believe the solution will pass through the support to what the Commission has proposed in terms of amendment of gas directive and in terms of negotiation with Russia. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I would like to come back on what... Uh, ...market, uh, like uh, there is a trade-off between reliability and, uh, and cheapness. And it is 
uh, and uh, and I think that this needs this is the message that we need to carry out uh, that in fact uh, and that's that's the message which is not only a political an economic message if somebody can abuse of a monopoly power he will <laughs> and it happens and the fact that the EU Commission has started uh, an antitrust procedure um, years ago and found uh, with numbers, uh, we can have clear evidence of the fact that when uh, Gazprom could exert its uh, monopoly position, it did so. And uh, the prices were higher, and as the dependence was higher, also the reliability was uh, uh, decreased and not increased. So I think that this is the message that, uh, that we are uh, sharing together uh, between Ukraine and, and Poland. And, uh, and the fact that if we go further more in this direction, building Nord Stream 2, we will increase even this dependence and we will be in less and less uh, good situation. And that will affect, of course, uh, our neighbor and friend Ukraine and Poland stands firmly behind Ukraine's independence and that's the independence of the country which is being played here. But that is also impacting EU solidarity and all the efforts made by all our countries and European Commission in order to put a market which is a transparent market. Where we have uh, this issue of, uh, of gas, there is corruption, there is aggression, there is exertion of, of, of power. We would like to stop it. We would like to, to, to treat gas as a normal commodity and, and, and end this era of uh, uh, gas being, uh, being a weapon or uh, uh, a way to exert uh, pressure on countries which are dependent on this, uh, on this energy resource. And this is, all the discussion is, uh, is, is about really very high stake, even if at the technical level it is discussed in a very legal uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and quite complicated tools. We are discussing about amendment of directives, we are discussing about unbundling, etc., etc. But we should at all time keep in mind this stake uh, for the region and for European Union, which is behind uh, uh, gas security uh, and gas as uh, a competitive market. Um, I would like to uh, to uh, touch a little bit what Mr. Minister Kurtika said and uh, underline it once again that uh, during the last two, more than two years, we have not signed and import a single molecule of gas from different direction than Russia, which was more uh, expensive than Russian gas. All of we, all of what we imported during the last two years, was it LNG from USA or uh, LNG from Qatar gas, or uh, from spots from European uh, market or spots or LNG from Norway. All of them were cheaper than gas from Russia, which is offered to PG and in Poland. That's how the monopoly works. That's why we are trying to change this situation. We need, as I said before, five years to conclude the most important infrastructure projects to create a real diversified market and, clear, and create a real competitive market thanks to diversification of origins of supplies. That's why we are so strongly and shocked that Europe is allowing in itself to be more and more monopolized by Russian gas, by new pipelines, which are uh, violating somehow European law. That is really something which is difficult for us, for Ukraine probably, to imagine. We've experienced that. We allow them to construct huge pipeline at the beginning of 90s and now we are paying price for that. Don't do that. And uh, what I would like also to add is that to survive, to, uh, the, the, the only way to survive uh, European, uh, Ukrainian market, Euro Ukrainian um, 
uh, transmission system is to stop this pipeline for the Baltic Sea, the second line, the second part of Nord Stream project. Uh, that is the only uh, solution how to help uh, European integrated market. It's not like as first, the Commission Vestager said yesterday that it will Gazprom who will hopefully integrate European market. We don't want to be integrated with Europe by Gazprom. And uh, we will be able to do that by ourselves. But what we need is as a support. Support not uh, in terms of not supporting uh, such a pipeline, such a project. Unfortunately, after yesterday's decision, after uh, how the works on the directive are going on, having, <laughs> having in mind that, uh, that the works on directive will be uh, conducted uh, by the Austrian presidency, the only, uh, the only solution to stop this pipeline is probably sanctions on it. Thank you. I would, um, I would have one concrete follow-up to your presentation um, um, in terms of political support for the, uh, for the proposal that you made in Ukraine. Could you say something on, uh, on that? Is that just a Naftogaz proposal or is there some political support for... Um, Yes, there is support. Uh, however, uh, I fully agree, by the way, uh, with point made uh, by our Slovakian colleague that uh, Ukraine has to do a lot of homework. However, there is also an opposition to this idea in Ukraine. And this imposition comes from the fact that many, especially anti-European politicians, are publicly criticizing Europe, saying, look, on one hand, we asked to do reforms, to do something which is in line with European key. On the other hand, behind our back, Europe is building Nord Stream 2. So what's the point of all the story if we at the end of the, den, of the day, because of those actions, we will lose 3% of our GDP and will risk basically full-scale military invasion from Russian Federation. And I would say that uh, no matter how we treat those people, the question they're raising uh, has grounds, definitely has grounds. Uh, and I'm also, I fully agree with the fact that until Nord Stream 2 is about to be built, it is on the picture, the likelihood of inviting anyone to manage the system which may lose 75% of its load in two year period is highly unlikely. That will have dramatic impact on Ukraine, and I believe not only on Ukraine, but also on Europe. However, uh, to um, build on that, I believe that now uh, everything in this respect is in the hands of the European Commission. Everything that the European Commission has leverage to do one simple thing, which we've been suggesting to do uh, in previous years. And that is called Russian bluff. Russians have been bluffing and threatening Europe. They will stop supplying gas. They will go to China. They will send gas via LNG, I don't know, maybe to moon, whatever. It's, it's not realistic. It's all bluff. And such a biggest consumer of Russian gas in Europe uh, that is the only source of profit for Gazprom, because everything else what they do is loss-making, huge loss-making, definitely has a huge leverage to make Gazprom follow European rules. Now, unfortunately, it happens vice versa. Gazprom makes Europe follow their rules of the game. And that, what is a huge surprise to me, it's also a surprise to everybody. I heard yesterday comments from US colleagues about the outcome of anti-monopoly investigation. Well, maybe they're a bit biased because Apple was fined for 13 billion euros in two years without any discussion. Maybe they're biased, but I don't think so. I believe they also have ground to say so. So my view is that if Europe and Ukraine don't go the same direction with the same strategic goal using the same European principles, the likelihood of success is close to zero. If those rules are followed, I'm pretty much convinced we're going to achieve what we plan to achieve. Integrated, transparent and efficient European market, which will include in its boundaries also Ukraine. Thank you. 
Okay, as I said before, a way forward is a really difficult issue and uh, it's difficult to advise. But in my opinion, uh, a way forward uh, is to continue with reforms, with unbundling uh, process, uh, with the selection of a foreign partner in whatever form final Ukraine uh, choose. And then together, all stakeholders, government, Naftogaz, and these uh, partners prepare a concept we can, which can affirm that uh, Ukrainian system will remain the most capable also for future uh, decades. And on the other hand, uh, securing that all regulatory technical standards uh, are implemented. And at the same time, uh, it's uh, economically viable uh, solution and then with this uh, to call for multilateral talks and at least in this very complex discussion to to let's say solve uh, economic part of the of the story and I'm pretty sure according to our internal uh, calculations uh, Ukrainian system uh, is and could be after modernization very attractive for shippers including the main one Thank you. Uh, so I would like just to give a positive note that in the last six months we have seen considerable progress and speed up in all the, um, the momentum in Ukraine on this issue with the help of the EU. And I feel that uh, on our part, uh, European TSO, that, that we are ready to do our, our jobs and to, to help uh, Ukrainian side to, to progress on this issue. Many thanks. Um, so. To close the event, um, I would like to uh, um, close by saying essentially that for me the event showed that uh, the uh, Ukraine and the EU are in, in one team in that. And uh, I think both sides uh, need to, uh, to work hard to come up with a credible solution. The solution is not yet clear, so we have, uh, uh, we have to, uh, to work hard. And there's a couple of involved players, some of them uh, here around. Uh, I would like uh, to, to ask you to, uh, uh, to assist me in thanking the, uh, the organizers of this uh, very interesting event and the, uh, the panelists. Thank you very much.